Uh, hi. Uh, I'm not going to be taller than you. Uh, and a couple of reasons. One is I don't like to be. And two, uh, I have hay fever. And until the frost comes, I'm not really worth squat. So uh, I'm doing this very old tech. And so we'll see how the timing works out. 2,200 words. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's a narrative about me because I'm at that age where it seems like everything would just come back to me. Uh, I arrived at Michigan State in 1979 equipped with some decent skills in Fortran and a sense of the changing world of academics. My graduate work at Berkeley had taught, uh, had brought me together with naval architects uh, who are just using primitive CAD programs. Economists obsessed with SPSS. And one clever computer science uh, graduate student who showed me a prototype of a modem and a briefcase. And apparently that was quite illegal on his part and I could have been arrested. So there you are. That was the 1970s. Uh, one of my only non-academic friends, a literature major from uh, uh, Oberlin, I had learned COBOL and earned a rather impressive uh, income debugging operating systems in San Francisco for big corporations. Everything about the computer revolution, though, was ignored uh, and, uh, of course, by my fellow graduate students in the faculty uh, in history who saw nothing of value over there. Uh, the one exception was a little old man lost to history called Lawrence Harper who had bought an old IBM mainframe, a small one, and spent his own money slowly digitizing colonial maritime records. Uh, he had a squadron of women who would type all this stuff in uh, onto cards. It would be uh, submitted. Uh, he was considered a slightly embarrassing crank. Uh, in my first years here, I continued to make small, er, I'm sorry, huge spreadsheets on the details of the lives of 19th century American ministers. I received a small grant uh, so that a squadron, again, of middle-aged women, uh, part of the story that's always ignored, the people who are actually working on a lot of the stuff, uh, they were all working downstairs in Berkey in the basement as key punchers. Now you all have done key punching, of course. Uh, it, it could barely go in there because the noise was was overwhelming. But out of it came boxes of data cards for me, and I would take them over and run the program, blowing on them wherever there was dust. Uh, as the lowest ranking member of a very elderly US history faculty, I was assigned huge classes where organization skills mattered much more than creativity. I did become close to the extraordinary Justin Kestenbaum, uh, uh, again, sort of lost to memory, who was also thinking about primitive forms of humanity tech humanities technology. But neither of us could quite figure out uh, what to do in the history classroom and how to bring that together with the computer revolution. Uh, we did both buy K-Pros, uh, an allegedly portable computer. It was about 60 pounds. Uh, and uh, it made us brothers in the world of large floppy disks. Uh, the first breakthrough in my ability to use uh, humanities technology came when MSU announced in the early 1990s that it was going to provide net IDs to its students through the merit network. Uh, I believed foolishly, of course, 
that this might allow us to use email in some vital and creative way. I went to the appropriate office in the College of Arts and Letters and uh, uh, had to convince a skeptical staff member that there were such things as net IDs and that people would be sending one another messages over computers. I don't think she ever believed me, but she got me one. That's why my ID is Bailey, because even though it's only six characters, I was number one. Within the department, there are a few faculty becoming keenly interested in the possibilities of humanities technology, most notably uh, Alan Fisher uh, and Justin. Hardly a crowd. And then my colleague Bill Hickson decided to retire. In replacing him, we made a rather broad search of 20th century historians. And one who seemed particularly interesting was a junior faculty member at Washington University. He was a member of a small group led by Richard Jensen at uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, who are making the use of the brand new and somehow somewhat proprietary software listserv. Uh, they had named their group HNET, and the purpose was to enable discussions among practicing historians about issues that really mattered to them, such as bibliographies and sources. The vision was that a student uh, could become a member, and they could, and in fact did, uh, talk online with some of the most prominent uh, historians in the country. It took some doing, a lot of doing. But we hired Mark Cornblew, and he soon had housed HNET in the first Humanities Technology Center at MSU, uh, which Dean John Eady uh, dubbed Matrix. You may have heard of it, Dean. Uh, but he's not really a dean, he's just a dean. Uh, things took off. We got grants to do all sorts of clever digital projects. I knew that there were hidden tapes of men and women who experienced the Flint sit-down sit strike, and we drove to Flint, picked them up, and repaired and digitized them. There was, uh, uh, they then became a resource still housed on the Matrix uh, site. Uh, there were uh, other projects that uh, were always uh, popping up, uh, some of them got finished, some of them did not. Uh, students were engaged in helping to create these projects. I had the honor, the greatest moment was I had the honor to participate in interviews with some of the heroes of the anti-apartheid struggle. And those were a small part of the remarkable overcoming apartheid site. For all of these, we gave some serious thought about how to use them in the classroom. But that end always seemed to come after Funding had run. Uh, uh, two projects allowed me a little more latitude in thinking about digital technology. Uh, we got the first Teaching American History grant uh, to collaborate uh, with teachers in uh, Battle Creek. And we tried to convince them that computer assisted teaching would be wonderful for them. What we learned, and this is about my learning as much as about my doing, what we learned is, of course, they had no time for that crap. Uh, they were running fast to meet the standards of, of that particular regime. And so although they were very interesting, I think they learned a lot. Uh, I don't think in the long run they deployed much of that in the classroom. Uh, much more under my own control, I created several uh, websites uh, uh, that are now a digital uh, uh, humanities of a different type, which is online summer teaching. Uh, and uh, the best of which is my history of the space age class. But I don't like people in Lyman Briggs to know about it because they'll take it down. Uh, a few years ago, uh, in its wisdom, the university tore down Morrill Hall. We moved over to uh, the uh, brand spanking old uh, old horticulture building, but it had been somewhat renovated uh, for the people who were then sent off into exile in Wales. Uh, our chair uh, 
after we had gotten out of a lot of financial distress, uh, decided that this huge room that was down on the first floor should be uh, no longer our crack room, where we put every piece of garbage that we couldn't have, couldn't see actually throwing out, old desks, chairs, and so on. It was emptied, and we brought in brand new. Uh, and uh, we created this uh, new thing we called leader. Uh, I was uh, watching, and I was asked, yeah, there'll be a minute or two left. Uh, I was asked if, uh, uh, w we were all asked if anybody wanted to use it. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll hold my class. And, uh, the class was a History 480 class which was intended to be about the history of American forests. Well, that was not going to go. So uh, I decided instead to take a project that I had created in 1998, a website called Pluralism and Unity. Uh, and they were going to critique this website about the turn of the century arguments over whether this should be a unitary society or we should accept pluralism. Uh, the site had been created for the Lisbon World's Exposition of 1998 and had been shown in kiosks. And I was kind of proud of it. It had been created moments after Tim Berners-Lee and uh, the people in, uh, in Illinois allowed us to start using the web. Uh, my buddy who was doing some of the tech stuff had stacks of books and he would look desperately to how we change it from one one shade of green to another. So we were very proud of it. It was very revolutionary. When I showed it to my students, they hated it, despised it, thought all the colors were wrong, every bit of design was wrong. Uh, and for the first four weeks of the class, it was a blast because they could tell me off and they felt completely secure. And then I turned it around on them and I said, okay, now you're creating websites. And the rest of the term, they were supposed to create websites about uh, the subject matter that they had been working on, pluralism and unity. Well, that worked and it didn't work. Uh, uh, one did one on the Civil War in Illinois, which had uh, moments of pluralism in it, but not much. Uh, another did a, a project on 19th century American rugby. It was something that wasn't fitting with what I was doing. Some did beautiful sites. Georgino was thinking of those. Some did beautiful sites that uh, had very little content but were absolutely stunningly gorgeous. Some did rather ugly sites uh, that I thought accomplished a lot. So, you know, which you, you we were learning and Together we were playing in the fields of humanities technology. One of the students, though, is where I want to finish this. Uh, she uh, was the only black student in the class. She was about to go off to teach uh, history to elementary school students. And she said that she wanted her site to be about black inventors. And my, uh, uh, my heart sank because what a, what a cliche. Really. And then her next sentence changed everything. I want there to be games, she said, because it was for elementary and, and uh, middle school. What do you mean, I asked, which led to weeks of conversation. Uh, one of my students helped her create a, a, a Rebus site. Uh, she created a bunch of other games. And in the end, you know, the games weren't great. Uh, but they were all about black inventors. Uh, and in the summer, last summer, we had a bunch of middle school kids come from inner city Chicago, from Southside. Uh, and they were all gung-ho about going to college. And I gave a talk, I was asked to give a talk, gave one on Motown. I thought I was being really hip. They didn't know anything about Motown. Uh, they didn't care. 
And then she got up and she showed the site and they went nuts. They went wild. They were shouting, waving their arms. They were learning about black inventors by playing games. And I thought, she's right, I'm wrong. I've learned yet another thing, uh, which is, uh, I've got th three things I've learned. Exercise patience. Don't force a technology where it doesn't want to go. Practice attentiveness. The students tell you whether you're being, as English say, too clever. And third, embrace opportunities. The business of humanities technology requires collaboration, accepting ideas that surprise you, and good collaboration can have wondrous results. I'm done.